I think we'll make a start. Uh, hello and welcome to this session on uh, streaming as a supporting component of broadcast. Uh, my name is Jake, Jake Ward. Uh, I'm a business development director at Groovy Gecko. And this session is really focused on how broadcasters, in this case in particular Channel 4, are using additional streaming content to support their TV broadcasts and how that helps retain audiences and increase engagement. Uh, we're going to look at two particular case studies over the next 45 minutes and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, and so uh, to introduce both these case studies is my first guest who is uh, Kate Quarton uh, and she's worked for Channel 4 since 2008 and is currently their multi-platform commissioner for Factual. Uh, and also joining me is Craig Mole, who's actually my MD at Groovy Gecko so I'm contractually obliged to say it's by far the best streaming company here uh, <laughs> and has built a reputation on developing unique solutions for difficult streaming problems and I think you'll agree <laughs> when you see both of these solutions today and these case studies today they are quite different and interesting. Uh, so to begin with I'm going to ask Kate to come up and give us an overview uh, of, of what was actually done and then Craig's going to look at a, a technical solution uh, in each case. So Kate. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so uh, Channel 4, I don't know if kind of you followed any, t any of Channel 4's projects, but basically I'm the multi-platform commissioning editor for Factual. And, you know, we, we're really into multi-platform at Channel 4. Um, we have a band of multi-platform commissioning editors. I'm the one for Factual, but we have one in entertainment, we have one in uh, comedy, in drama, in uh, features and fact and, and then news and current affairs. And so the important thing for us is that we're exploring new types of content, really. We're kind of, we're creating new types of telly whereby the online is integral to the TV. And ultimately, if you, if you stripped out the online, the TV would cease to exist. So that's what we're interested in. And we, I do a kind of whole range of different projects. Um, but kind of recently, over the last year, we've uh, got really into doing natural history in a new way, really. We're kind of... You know, Channel 4 can never, ever compete with the BBC kind of making these luxurious, beautiful, natural history films that cost £8 million and take kind of 10 years to make. Um, so we're never going to compete in that market because the BBC are doing it and doing it absolutely brilliantly, kind of gold stars all around. So what we're interested in is doing natural history in a bit of a Channel 4 way. So it always had a, has a kind of bit of an edge and it's kind of presenting this genre in a new way. And what's very important about it for us is that it's about doing natural history in a new way that attracts a younger audience. So we kind of want kids to get into this stuff and we want kind of people to be consuming it online and sharing it with their friends. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to talk about, well, we've got two projects to talk about, but firstly, I'm going to talk about a project called Hippo Wild Beast Live. I don't know if anyone watched it. Ah, oh, oh, lovely. It's all, always nice when somebody's watched it. Um, so we're going to talk about Hippo first and then move on to Foxes Live, which was one that we did um, kind of in May of this year. But I think the best way to kind of explain it really rather than me bang on is just to show you a tape. So we'll just play a little reel which kind of outlines exactly what we did in Hippo. Hippo Wild Beast Live, an innovative multi-platform event broadcast over a week using cutting-edge technology, social media, and traditional TV spots to reinvent how natural history programming is produced and watched. We broadcast live, bringing the food chain to life at channel4.com forward slash hippo. Hippo Wild Beast Live set out to bring the fascinating and dangerous animal world of the African savannah live and direct to the UK audience in a way never seen before. I'm heading deep into Zambia, a country at the heart of Africa. Streamed live action was beamed direct from location in Zambia to the laptops, smartphones and screens of a captivated UK audience. We've had the most extraordinary action here over the last hour or so between crocodiles and hyenas literally fighting over the hippo carcass. Steph, I mean, it's been phenomenal behaviour to watch, isn't it? Yeah, this is stuff that I've never seen before in all the years I've spent watching spotted hyenas. On-site experts constantly monitored the action, conducting daily experiments, tracking the local lions and other animals spotted. 
how much was left of the hippo and who's eaten it. The crocs are now entering the carcass through a hole that was made by the hyenas. All updated regularly on the homepage, bringing multiple layers of rich educational content to the event. Social media was used extensively throughout the campaign to promote the series and for viewers to engage with the experts by posting their questions. These two are only a small sample of who's available for you. Please tweet them at Hippo Wild Feast. A Daily Channel 4 TV promotional spot featuring presenter Mark Evans reached out to and brought in a whole new audience to the event. It's day four of our live food chain experiment. Engaging people of all ages and very importantly, those who don't normally tune in to natural history programming. The TV spot was also used as an online springboard for Mark and the experts who went live straight after for a Q&A on the website, answering the viewers' questions and providing an amazing daily update on the action. We have a question in from Joanna Hughes. Hi, Joanna. You've asked, how much does the hippo weigh? But the project wasn't just an incredible live event. It also served to promote the 90-minute Channel 4 documentary, which transmitted at the end of the live event. We want to explore how a mighty two-ton hippo is consumed and recycled by nature. Hippo Wild Feast Live brought the viewers on an incredible journey, from day one right through to the dusty end, packing every minute with stats, animal data, live updates, video highlights, expert analysis, and incredible action. All streamed live from the soaring heat of the African savanna to the screens of our viewers here in the UK. Hippo Wild Feast Live provided social engagement, live action, and new insights into the amazing natural world through one groundbreaking innovative live production. Uh, so that was Hippo. Um, we did Hippo in the, the, that project in 2011, November 2011. And uh, we worked with a production company called Tigress, who are kind of well established in the natural history genre. They're based in Bristol. And so Tigress essentially kind of delivered the TV side of the project. Endemol Digital d delivered the digital side of the project. Um, and then we also worked with Groovy Gecko, who delivered the streaming. Um, and so it's just important, I think, just to quickly mention the structure of how it worked. Basically, we got ourselves a dead hippo. Inspired by Big Brother, we thought, well, do you know what? Like, to kind of create these incredible natural, natural history kind of scenes that we've never seen before, that we've never captured on tape, we need to build the stage. And the only way to do that, apart from putting animals in a cage, is to kind of essentially bait them and put a big feast in the middle where, you know, buy a kind of water source and they will all flock to it. And, uh, and it was incredible. We got things on tape that actually have never been recorded before, you know, kind of literally a croc coming nose to nose with a hyena and just snapping at each other. I mean, it, it, it was quite incredible. Um, and so we learned lots of things from all of these new sites that we'd seen. But so what we did basically, we put the hippo there. The hippo <coughs> start to finish was, was, was kind of skin and bones by the end of the fifth, Six. sixth day? Yeah, sixth day, yeah. So it took six days end to end. And how we structured it was we kind of plotted the hippo in, in situ and then basically kick-started the live stream which then was running online 24 seven, but then on television for two minutes every night, just after the news, we had a live update. So Craig not only had to deliver a stream for use online 24 seven, but also a live stream that could be broadcast. And then at the end of that week, um, we all the rushes were kind of flown back to the UK and we did the speediest edit I think we've ever done on a natural history film and we got it on the box in about a week after kind of the live event was over. Um, so now I will hand over to uh, Craig to talk us through technically kind of actually how we managed to deliver a stream both online and for broadcast. Thanks, Kate. So uh, being a stream media show, I'm not going to be going into a huge amount of detail about how streaming works, but just to run through the workflow. So we had our, uh, our lovely hippo, uh, multiple cameras. Obviously, this is uh, night and day. Um, and then we had a satellite uplink, uh, which we had to fly in from South Africa for all sorts of economic and political problem, uh, reasons. Um, and um, from there, the satellite uplink went um, obviously to the, to the satellite, and then we downlinked that uh, uncompressed broadcast feed in London at our downlink facility in London. And then from there, we ran it through a whole bunch of encoders, stick it into a CDN, and obviously the devices pulled it from there. 
So um, very, a very typical sort of workflow using uh, AV over satellite. We'll talk about IP over satellite on, on the next case study. Um, some, of the, um, some of the challenges that you may not be apparent uh, and, and uh, you know, we didn't believe were going to be uh, as severe as they were um, were as follows. First of all, Kate mentioned that we did 24-7 streaming. We actually didn't. It's slightly inaccurate. The reason why we couldn't do 24-7 is that the ground temperature in Zambia at 12 o'clock is 60 degrees Celsius. So before we'd even started uh, on this, I think the first day we'd lost three cameras. The solder in the cameras melted. So this is something completely alien to people sitting in the nice comforts of uh, London trying to you know, do project planning. So we uh, could only broadcast for 21 hours a day because between 12 and 3 we had to shut down everything. It was impossible to actually uh, broadcast. Uh, we lost our first amp on the uh, on the uplink uh, by the by the second day, due to the over uh, due to overheating and also to having dirty power. So, never underestimate the uh, the ravages of Africa. Um, now, to accomplish that, obviously, we still need to make sure that the website is looking good. Um, that people seeing what's on the website is, is is what they need to see. So we had we introduced a whole uh, mechanism of staging. So when you went to the website and you could see the stream, obviously the stage was live. When we had to bring down the satellite, we had to change the stage so that the picture with the, the area in the screen where the player was was still relevant to what people were looking at. And we had emergency things like, uh, you know, ready to go, you know, we have a technical emergency, you know, please hold on and things like that. So we, it wasn't just about streaming, it was about the whole joined up workflow to have an empathy for the experience that viewers would, uh, would see. And editorially, I think that it's really important to note that those messages, it's really important to be honest, I just think for the end user. So Actually, when it was too hot, we said, look, it's too hot, our kit is melting, um, we'll be back at three when it gets cooler. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that was, that, was, uh, that was fun. And um, the guys, uh, sadly, I didn't go out there, although um, 60 degree ground temperature, I'm actually pretty, uh, pretty glad I didn't, didn't go <laughs> out at the end. But what we had to do, we had six days to go, we had one amplifier uh, left uh, on the satellite, and we still had six days of 21 hours of... Uh, uh, broadcasting. So we started to go old school. We, um, the guys there started to build what we call a bush fridge, uh, which basically, if you think about when you go to a restaurant and you've got your terracotta wine cooler, it's pretty much the same sort of uh, idea. So we were building rocks and things right next to the satellite amps and putting water over them to naturally try and keep the, uh, the temperature down by even two or three degrees. So uh, I hope that drives home the point that you know you can plan as much as you want in a in a pub or around a, in a boardroom in London, but when you actually have to go out there and do it in the field, this is not trivial stuff. So um, and we'll come on to foxes in a second, which sounds uh, like a lot less of an issue, mm -hmm. but it had different different issues. And the temperature thing, you kind of think, well, you knew what the temperature was going to be. Actually, we didn't. It was it ended up it was 10 degrees hotter than actually it had yep. been on the recce or that actually any kind of forecast had predicted. So it was Since records that. began, I believe, Kate. Oh, was Since it? records. Was it really that hot? <laughs> <laughs> so you go. Um, right, I think that's uh, from the technical side. Um, the other thing to cover is um, we, we had to stream to the website, but we also had to provide contribution fees for two minutes every day to, the, uh, to TX. Uh, and that's always nerve-wracking. You know, uh, we mentioned the BBC. The BBC go live, there is bells and braces for absolutely everything because the last thing anyone, any broadcaster wants to do is go to black when, you, when you're broadcasting live. And we all know if you brought, you know, into I webcasters in the room that when you go live, it always gets the heart thumping. Even after 12 years, every time we go live, there's always a bit of a thump there. So you have to, you have to make sure that there is, um, uh, you know, a risk mitigation exercise. Um, in terms of cost and, and things like that and, and being on the other side of the world, sometimes you just have to pray and you have other editorial ready in case the live stream uh, you know doesn't materialize so uh, so that's what we did um, there was something else I wanted to mention on uh, hippo but I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that at the end after some other questions I think great in that case I oh, in that case I suggest we move on to the second case study which is uh, Fox's Eye. yep do you want to intro that first Kate okay so uh Foxes Live was actually a bit of a kind of evolution from Hippo. As we've kind of discussed, there were lots of issues going live out of Africa. Once we'd actually finished the Hippo project, um, a colleague of mine uh, over at the BBC 
said to me, oh, I didn't tell you this whilst you were doing it, but basically kind of the BBC decided four years ago never to go live out of Africa again because it's so problematic. Um, and it is, you know, it gets really, really hot. Power is just kind of uh, up and down. You know, we, had, we had another thing whereby in addition to the streaming, there were lots, there were lots of other features on the site, but we um, wanted to GPS and track lots of animals in the area. And we put these tags on some vultures um, but they are actually they were, they were kind of mobile tags, and unfortunately, actually, the mobile reception in Zambia is really limited, and nobody gave these vultures a map, and so they just flew out of it, and therefore, you know, that was it. We never could track them. You know, you can only track them once they were back in the kind of mobile signal. So going live out of Africa is a nightmare, and so we thought, right, well, we came this far technologically, and we did lots of good things, but there were lots of things that kind of we didn't manage, like we didn't manage to kind of track all the animals that we wanted to. Um, and then streaming was brilliant, but it was fraught, and between two and three, which is actually a really important time for people in offices to flick on and look and watch a stream kind of whilst they're on their lunch break or whatever, they can do it. So um, we thought, right, we want to kind of work on home turf and see if we can achieve all the things that we set out to do with Hippo. So then the next question was, well, what's the subject? What are we gonna do? And um, and so we look to one of our biggest animals in the UK, which is the fox. There aren't many that big. There's the kind of badgers and deers, but, but there aren't many in that category, really. So we thought, right, well, let's apply all of the thinking of Hippo um, and all of the technology, and we came up with Foxes Live, which we, uh, we ran in May of this year. So I'll just roll the tape, and then you can kind of get a sense of exactly what we did. You might have watched it. I don't know. Foxes Live, Wild in the City, a groundbreaking multi-platform event. Tonight, we launch a nationwide campaign to investigate Britain's most controversial carnivore. Four live television broadcasts and an online campaign engage the public in an innovative natural history experiment. We'll be gathering data from across the country in the biggest ever fox survey that's been attempted. We need your help, though. For the first time, a television campaign encouraged viewers to take part in a comprehensive scientific study of a wild urban animal. By going online, they could upload fox sightings and check out activity in their neighborhood compared to other parts of the country. You can see there's the map of the UK. Let's have a look in Surrey. Isn't that the most brilliant sight? Thank you, Becky. Ellesmere Port. Is that not the cutest little cub? Those blue eyes will turn brown, though as it gets old. Let me uh, restart that one. Uh, we'll play it outside of the, yeah. the main. The live streaming was a little bit better than that. <coughs> <laughs> That's it on the left, Jake. Left. That one. Yeah. Foxy's Live, Wild in the City a groundbreaking multi-platform event. Tonight, we launch a nationwide campaign to investigate Britain's most controversial carnivore. Four live television broadcasts and an online campaign engage the public in an innovative natural history experiment. We'll be gathering data from across the country in the biggest ever fox survey that's been attempted. We need your help, though. For the first time, a television campaign encouraged viewers to take part in a comprehensive scientific study of a wild urban animal. By going online, they could upload fox sightings and check out activity in their neighborhood compared to other parts of the country. You can see there's the map of the UK. Let's have a look in Surrey. Isn't that the most brilliant sight? Thank you, Becky. Ellesmere Port. Is that not the cutest little cub? Those blue eyes will turn brown, though as it gets older. 18,000 <coughs> people filled in an online survey which revealed why foxes divide public opinion. I think they're cute, but they're also vermin. We have taken over the, the, the property, basically. It's, it's there, they, they were there first. And state-of-the-art live tracking maps charted the forays of wild foxes. We've got seven foxes in all, each of them wearing a GPS collar. People were able to track the foxes live, seeing how fast and how far they traveled each day, gradually building up a picture of each fox's daily routine. The opening show featured the live release of Chico, 
A rescued fox wearing a GPS collar. Well, let's set Chico free. Off you go. I'm going to be tracking Chico live here. You can see where he's been today. That's where he is right now. You can do the same right now by logging on. This highly popular twin screening moment generated over a thousand hits per second. The largest channel4.com hit rate since the Big Brother evictions. Welcome back to Foxes Live, and they are very live at the moment at both our dens. There was 24 hour live streaming for two urban fox dens. Yep, yeah, we've got five cups. Oh, one of the adults coming in with a bit of food. Featuring the life and death struggles of the vixens and their young cubs. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that we've ever seen this film. Oh no, what was that? She's got a dead cub. Online viewers watched the den streams late into the night, commenting on the unfolding stories. One character though, Tom, seems a bit of a loner. He's likely to be bottom of the pack. User-generated content was integral to the broadcast. Last night, we asked if anyone had seen a black fox or a hybrid smoky red. This is a black fox that's been seen in Surrey, and this one is from Rumford in Essex, and it's a cross between a red fox and a black fox. That is a smoky red. You need to be frightened. Lively debate took place on set and online. So what's going to happen? No, no, we're well, saying... That's what, that's what I'm that's saying. What, that's what's happening there. What we're saying is if you feed fox and series highlights were made available on the website. The scale of the project generated a media buzz across radio, magazines, and the press. And with over 36,000 sightings and surveys submitted online, the final show presented the findings. Entering houses was a really big shock for me. It's a lot more than I thought. So we started off with about 79% people liking foxes, and over the week, as the programme's gone on, it's going up to 86%. So now, what everyone wants to know, how many urban foxes do you think there are? A population estimate from sightings of around about 40,000. Citizen Science had produced the most comprehensive study of the urban foxes in the UK ever undertaken. By seamlessly integrating content across multiple platforms, Foxes Live inspired mass participation and entertained the nation. So that was Foxes Live. We work with a production company called Windfall, who are a brilliant production company. And what's, what's fantastic about Windfall, from my perspective, is that they have absolutely embraced multi-platform because it's kind of not the easiest thing sometimes, working with TV production companies and, and making them kind of think in these new ways and, and try new things and try things like stick streaming or, or create these kind of online worlds that are knitted into their TV programs. Um, so we worked with Windfall and they built a little multi-platform team within their own production team to run all of the online. Uh, Numico, a company based up in Leeds, built the website. Numico are a fantastic company. Um, they turned this website around start to finish in about five weeks. It was a really, really speedy commission and Numico did a fantastic job on the build. And then we also worked with Groovy Gecko who provided the live streaming. Um, and so... For us, I mean, foxes, I suppose that you kind of think, gosh, why did you, why did you make six hours of programming about foxes? Um, but, but the fact that we could apply technology in this way and unlock all of these new stories was a new approach to natural history for us. And, um, and it did really well, and, and lots of people came to it, um, and it rated well, and we also kind of did brilliantly online, and lots of people came to the stream, and people engaged with it in a way that we kind of never seen before, really. Um, 20,000 people filled in the survey, 20,000 people plotted foxes <coughs> on our map, and it just enabled the scientists to actually build a picture of foxes in this country that actually they've never been able to before. So now we know a lot more about foxes in the UK as a result. Um, so I will hand on over to uh, Craig to talk about live stream, but there's lots of funny stories around streaming when it comes to these foxes, because for us it was, I suppose, a big gamble as to whether or not we actually stream live from a fox's den because it, it's tricky. It's tricky to get your cameras in there and secure that the foxes are going to stay there. Um, foxes use dens a bit like we use houses, as in once, once they've kind of had enough of living somewhere, they'll literally just move their whole family out and find another hole somewhere, find another den. And then, and then what we saw in this case when we, were, when we were actually kind of rigging these dens is that 
another family moved in, which was really brilliant for us because we'd spent all the time and money rigging a fox's den and then we lost the family and we were a couple of days to TX and it was just, yeah, it, it was... It, it, it was a bad time because it, it takes months to find these dens and, and, and plan how you're going to get the cameras in and they can smell you, you know, and then they clear off and that's it, it kind of end off. But in the end, successfully, we managed to rig two foxes' dens and I'll hand over to Craig to tell us how technologically we kind of provided the streams. Okay, so uh, again, the very basic workflow. The first case study we looked at on Hippo was uh, using a different satellite technology. That was AV over satellite, old school. Um, the biggest problem that we had uh, at the Dens and also the Broadcast Hub, which is at Battersea, even though it's in the centre of London, uh, neither at the Hub or at the Dens did we have any connectivity. So doing streaming, um, you know, uh, without connectivity, obviously a big challenge. So the only thing that you can do there is actually to bring the connectivity to the actual uh, Dens. So at each of the Dens, Isha and Landon, we had two IP over satellite uplinks, uh, and they were powered uh, by some generators. And uh, so we had uh, teams uh, mixing feeds from the various cameras on site, sending a final feed through the encoder. So at this stage, we were on IP. That went basically up to the internet, to the CDN. So on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see from the CDN cloud, uh, the various clients could then go and, um, and, uh, and grab, the, um, grab the content. Um, but the broadcast hub where all the action was happening, as you saw in the, in the film there, was actually at Battersea, a very dramatic uh, setting. But again, no connectivity. So we had to have another downlink truck there that could bring down the two feeds live so that they were put onto the set and the uh, talent could then comment and use that and integrate that into the actual um, feed. So, uh, and then uh, you can see the diagram at the bottom. So from those two <coughs> uh, max, they were used to uh, show people what was happening uh, on the actual set, and they were then um, uh, mixed in with live, the final live camera feeds uh, at the OB truck, and then from there went directly up on uh, onto transmission. So that's the technical workflow. The um, uh, again, there were some very unique uh, challenges to this. Um, the uh, the first uh, the first thing, as we said, was the the connectivity was just not having having it available. We had to sort that out. But the second thing I want to, um, actually we're going to talk about that at the end, but I'm going to allude to it now, um, is, um, is as with Hippo, we also had to take that streaming content and make it available for transmission. So uh, that's not a trivial thing to do. You would have thought that big broadcasters could take down satellite feeds and just mix in things if they want to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, broadcasters are set up to do very large scale, very planned, everything is risk mitigated and therefore lots of structure and rigidity. When we're trying to cut from one den to another or provide feeds, we, we can't just plan it in. So what we're using now and what we're encouraging other broadcasters to use is to leverage and exploit streaming media technology where you have those feeds. They may not be broadcast camera feeds, one compressed feeds, but when you've got a, an, uh, you know, a, a camera that, you, that you're using that's basically a CCTV camera at night, um, the actual context of what you're using it in, you can use a one megabit per second feed, which is quite adequate to actually uh, get your message across. So instead of having huge, like on Hippo, instead of having huge um, downlink <coughs> and traditional broadcast technology, we're now starting to see broadcasters use streaming media technology, even at low bit rates, like one megabit a second, to use as contribution feeds. So I think this is going to be uh, almost, and I think Channel 4 pretty much pioneered this approach, and I can see other broadcasters um, uh, taking this on. Um, okay, I, I think that's, uh, Jake, there was a, uh, another question about how we're going to sort of leverage the, uh, the technology, so I think I'm just going to go into it. So if you just yeah, want to yeah. just go to the next um, slide. I just want to go back to, to Hippo quickly. So again, just to remind you, uh, stream from Zambia on an AV, over, uh, AV uh, satellite. Um, on the right-hand side, there were some additional things that we were doing. The, uh, the Channel 4 site was so rich in editorial that we weren't just fo focusing, obviously, on the, uh, on the live stream, which was running 21 hours a day, but also there was all sorts of other things going on. So for example, you, if, you, if you miss something at 3 o'clock in the morning, the, 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 the shootout between the, the croc and the hyena, you wanted to see that. So you, there was an, a very large on-demand archive that needed to be created. So what we did there is, uh, in our broadcast standards dialing facility in, in, in London, was utilize some of the other broadcast technology that we use for clients. And one of those is what we call a channel logger. So this is basically a, um, a piece of software and hardware that logs anything that comes via the satellite. 
and we make that available as an interface so that editors around the world don't, don't have to be on site. They can then go and have a look at any of the feed that is, that is up there. So for example, if there was a spotter saying that you, uh, there is a, um, a feed of interest between one o'clock and, and five minutes past one, those um, remote loggers would go in and be able to download that uncompressed content remotely multiple times or, or, or from multiple locations and then work at those on their desktop as if they were you know, given a, a tape or something from broadcast. So what we're doing here again is revolutionizing in a way the, the way in which we're um, exploiting streaming media uh, technology to help broadcasters provide more content and also to provide innovations in workflow. You know, a lot of the innovations that happen nowadays is not necessarily in the technology because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're 15 years in on this. But it's really to look at how, the, uh, how you utilize and exploit that technology in terms of your workflow to get as many people as possible to, uh, to use that. And one, obviously once it was already uh, then edited on somebody's desktop, they would just upload that to an OVP, or for those that you don't know, uh, an online video platform that then would run automatically um, and immediately into the actual site. So all of this is about joined up thinking. I think that's really the, the key thing. One of the challenges we have, as uh, Kate uh, mentioned right at the beginning, is that the BBC produce beautiful, beautiful stuff, but they have massive budgets. Other broadcasters aren't that lucky, so we're actually forced as streaming media providers and partners in, the, in, in this um, uh, enterprise to actually leverage as much as we can out of our technology to do more for a lot less and in a quicker um, uh, uh, co and more compressed um, uh, time periods. Thanks. So I, I want to move on to some Q&A. So uh, raise your hand if you've got any questions. Oh, I have one immediately over there. Yeah, you go first. Okay, just if anyone didn't catch that, um, lovely chap here just asked me what what next. So what next after kind of Hippo and Foxes, and and in in all honesty, I mean to be honest, it, we're open to ideas. You know, the biggest thing for us really is that is that we we want to cover kind of live natural history events in new ways, um, and and what sometimes we're kind of governed by, or what is a bit tricky, is the fact that actually a lot of big natural history events happen, uh, well, well, you can perhaps designate a window within which they might happen, which might be a month, or it might be six weeks, but depending on seasons, whether it's, whether it's kind of mass birthing with, you know, amongst kind of wildebeest in Africa, or whatever kind of natural phenomenon, um, volcanoes erupting, like, I mean, we saw with the BBC, they, they did their kind of volcano live um, program and, and ultimately you're always kind of trying to bank on something that you can guarantee in a certain time because we have to plot something in the schedule. Um, so that's kind of one constraint for us but we're up for imaginative ideas of kind of working around that so how do you operate whereby you actually get stuff into a television schedule but you can be a bit more flexible. Um, so for us we've got lots of ideas kind of bubbling away in kind of natural history space but totally open to ideas. I've probably been pitched rats live about 63 times now. <laughs> so so maybe, maybe don't go for that one. But, um, but anything else, anything else that you think kind of perhaps, you know, there's, there's a bit of potential for a big kind of live natural history event, definitely do get in touch. Great. So the other question was uh, about multiple devices. So in some of the slides you can see that, that we are already sending out to multiple devices as uh, on the end client stuff. Um, once you've got something in IP, you can pretty much put it anything, as long as that device can handle the IP uh, sort of connectivity. I think what we're looking at doing is, uh, is trying to, um, again, exploit as much as we can and use, and, and use streaming media as a slightly different method. Traditionally, streaming is just about delivering pictures. But if you, it's, if you think about what's happening uh, in things like subtitling, 
that's delivering other media piggybacking on streaming as almost a delivery channel. So I think that uh, we've got some projects on at the moment with some uh, clients where we're looking at using the stream media transport mechanism, a way of pig using that to piggyback other things like data, for example, uh, other audio tracks. So you know, we also specialize in doing multiple language um, conferences and things like that, so where you've got multiple languages. In fact, I think the, the biggest live event we've ever done was, uh, was 14 different uh, simultaneous live languages. So I think the world is evolving slightly. Um, the, the, the reason for that, I think, is that streaming media is a great enabler. If you look at broadcast and, and, and transmission, you basically are constrained by the EPG. So the EPG, the Electronic Program Guide, dictates to you what you can and can't watch on that particular platform. In a streaming media world, we're actually outside of those constraints. And that actually gives us huge amounts of scope to actually exploit all sorts of other things. So for example, I see down the line that when we're doing something for uh, Channel 4, let's say in two or three years' time, there will be so much content that we'll be able to do for Rats Live, because it's going to happen. You know, um, people will then uh, want to uh, demand so many almost niche streams inside that particular program that the EPG itself can't handle it. It's almost th taking the concept of the red button on broadcast, which is okay, but it's really cumbersome and slow. But on the internet, think about it, the red button, you can have almost as many channels as you want. So the way I try and ex explain this to people is, um, is, is try and picture a mosaic of channels. So uh, a 25 by 25 matrix, each of those with a little box that's actually got a live stream coming out of it. In theory, there's no reason why you couldn't click on a particular box and see what you want to see in there. I think I'd. Sorry. sorry, I'm very loud on this. Um, I think I'd also add into that about social and about some of the uh, elements of social and how that integrates into that, and ask about how that builds on what's already been done. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it's really important to know who our audience is, you know, because the audience is the most important important thing when it comes to kind of our business and what we do, and we want to create content that the audience want to watch. And so therefore we need to know them. Um, and so we're working all the time at Channel 4 to get to know our audience better. So ultimately we make programs that are better suited to them. So, um, you know, I mean, from a streaming perspective, I suppose, um, although we didn't do it on either of these projects, things like in the future, actually, we might put some streaming projects behind kind of a registration wall where actually we'll get to kind of know the audience better and build a kind of deeper um, relationship with them and kind of deliver better content to them that's better suited to them. Yeah, yeah, so we do, we do kind of when, you know, we never ask people to register unless, you know, they're essentially they're entering into this kind of reciprocal relationship where we're getting something and they're getting something, you know. Um, so therefore we might, when we do some kind of big multi-platform projects, when we're delivering kind of special features or um, kind of special content, then then we might put it kind of behind registration. Um, 4OD, you know, you, you register when you kind of use 4OD. Um, I did a project this year where we, uh, it was called the Damien Hurst 360 Private View, where basically you could see the Damien Hurst exhibition before the doors opened at the tapes, and you were taken, it was a piece of 360 video, and you could explore it, and an old building was kind of taking you around and Damon Hurst popped up here and there, but again, that was behind registration. But to Craig's point about kind of a matrix of, of live streams, I mean, for us, it's really important that ultimately, ultimately, that kind of editorially, that's compelling, you know? So, you know, we could just keep maxing out and, and deliver loads and loads and loads and loads of live streams, but actually, live streaming isn't suited to every project that, that kind of we work on. I mean, with sport, it's fantastic because that's the way you want to experience it. And with natural history, it's brilliant, again, because actually you kind of want to see that, you know, the animals in the wild doing what they do and having this kind of unique insight. But, yeah, we always think kind of very carefully about kind of actually what content we do stream. 
Yeah, I think uh, that's absolutely right. If content is king, then the audience is supreme. I mean, that's, uh, that, that really is what it is for broadcasters. The audience is the most important thing. So, again, the constraints of an EPG, if, you, if Hippo went out on Monday and Tuesday and then again on Thursday and Friday, well, what happens on the other days? So streaming is a great way to actually keep that momentum going, keep people reminded that there is actually something coming up on those other days. So you've got these two sort of trees that are the EPGs, and we use streaming almost as the hammock in between. So we call that hammocking to actually bring, make sure that the awareness of those EPG slots is still there. Um, the other thing that Jake mentioned is um, social media. If the audience is supreme, the way nowadays that everybody is, is integrate, interacting almost with anything, and sadly even at the expense of, of uh, human relationships, is through social media. Um, what was really surprising for me is how engrossed and how committed the audience for, uh, for Foxes were. Um, I, w I was the one at 12 o'clock on the last day who had to f switch off the last den feed from the satellite. Um, and uh, the, we were monitoring to see how many people were on at that moment and the comments that were going on. And I always remember there was one um, lady at the end who said, I've been watching this for a, a week. Uh, these, these foxes are almost like family to me. I don't know what I'm going to do after, the, uh, after this uh, ends. So you, whatever your reaction to that is, it's a genuine, you know, somebody, there are a lot of people out there who are uh, engaging with more and more broadcast pro programming, either online or offline, and that's why we've called this a complement between, you know, streaming complement and broadcast, who, um, who really uh, want to engage with this content. And streaming, marrying streaming media with uh, content is, uh, is, uh, is really the way to go. In fact, Channel 4 run a, a whole a bunch of events called Fuel 4, which is uh, a fantastic program, and they've run some recently where they've shown or, or demonstrated various other um, partners and suppliers uh, um, using second screen technology, uh, in other words, digital watermarking, to actually interact with the programming that they're watching. Um, and I think that's really groundbreaking stuff. Um, so I echo um, Kate's request. If, if anybody has some really good ideas in terms of content, um, get in touch with her. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have all these diverse uh, points of view and I think that's really what, uh, again, in a weird way, bringing social elements of from the partner side and to do, see what we can do to elevate and come up with new content ideas for broadcast. Definitely. And just to your point about, I suppose, describing streaming as complementary and almost kind of the cart leading the horse, sorry, the cart following the horse that is essentially the TV. You know, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, this weekend we all witnessed this incredible streaming event um, whereby, you know, Felix jumping out of his little balloon and, and landing on Earth, and eight million people watch that, which is incredible. And, you know, we're, we're totally up for new ideas around streaming, where ultimately streaming is the thing kind of leading the whole story. Um, and that's a brilliant example of that. Not only is that a good example of that, but also when it comes to social. I mean, most people found out about that on the day through Twitter, because, yeah. you know, ultimately the jump was kind of being postponed. It was supposed to happen on Thursday, and it kept shifting around. And so that's social media essentially just delivering your audience to this live stream, which is something that I think we can all take lessons from. How is it enjoyable to talk with you as a fan of the house? I think that was widely that piece of the paper this year. Yes, it sounds like a cult. And they just seem to be like the the end of the program. Who is on who now? And you think, I think for this is five G, which one do I watch? So how does there's a balance between the broadcasters who are sick yeah, you're, you're totally right, and they're kind of two kind of distinct positions. I think, you know, ultimately broadcasters are here and are around for the fact that people do like content editorialised, you know. You buy a certain newspaper because you want editorial, you want somebody else to kind of select the good stuff for you. Um, and, you know, that happens online in lots of different ways now. You know, YouTube, you get kind of videos surfacing, you know, according to kind of what you last watched and whatever else. But I think it's really important for us at Channel 4 to kind of, we're always... We always kind of build our projects around audience behavior and what people actually are kind of doing already at the moment or what they naturally do and then we kind of try to amplify it, tweak it up as opposed to making them do something that's totally foreign. You know, there's a reason why Big Brother lasted as long as it did and there's a reason why X Factor is, is still going strong and the fact is that those elimination shows essentially give give the audience often just a binary choice to make. You know, do you want X or, or X to go? Who do you want, Sheila or Graham? And, and almost that is often enough. 
you know, that level of interaction whereby there's perhaps a simple decision to make or that the, the audience can actually take control of a decision which will absolutely shape the editorial of the whole show. But another kind of program that I worked on uh, called Seven Days was at the other end of the scale where we didn't give the audience binary choices. We, we kind of left the audience with this question, tell them what you think they should do. And so that just leaves most people a bit stumped as in, well, I don't know, like go and buy a pint of milk or I don't know, go on a date with Jim. Like the options just weren't defined and so the audience were at, left at a bit of a loss really. Um, so it's really important to kind of craft your projects accordingly. And most people like that spot in the middle where there might be a binary choice to make or million pound drop where you can interact, you can answer questions but you're not being left charged with, right, I've got to write this story, I've got, I've got to write the ending to this drama. Uh, I would ask for more questions, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So uh, thank you for Craig Mole of Groovy Gecko and Kate Fulton of Channel 4, and thanks for coming out to see us.